Hey everyone, they say that money talks, but when it comes to the government, all that it ever says is goodbye, as civil servants keep frittering away that money like they're embarrassed to be seen with it, and here you and I are watching it all from the sidelines, though I did once meet a civil servant who said that the trick is to stop thinking of it as your money. Anyway, sit back as I count down some of the worst examples of UK government largesse. Number 10. Nationalised Industries You know, I thought I'd start with a prologue of sorts to show perhaps how bad things used to be, at least. In the years after the Second World War, the government was in charge of pretty much everything, but unlike someone playing the board game Monopoly, they didn't want to just stop with running the trains and the utility companies. They went on to run travel companies, British Airways had made the planes for them, and Rolls-Royce who supplied the engines to the airplanes, and they also owned BP who had made all the fuel, all run with balance sheets redder than Rudolph the Reindeer's nose. The government also decided to get into the car game for a bit. A lot of people decide to buy a little two-seater sport car when they're in their 60s, but for the government back in the 1960s, no less would do than buying up all the Jaguars and the MG factory as well as Austin Rover, Morris, the list goes on really. British Leyland went on to lose roughly £200 million a year, and that's all in a pre-inflation era when a pint of beer was only 35 pence. Eventually common sense prevailed and Mrs Thatcher sold the lot off, and in 2002 Stephen Byers told people that Network Rail was officially a not-for-profit organisation, as if anyone was under the false illusion otherwise that it was somehow making a profit. Nowadays, of course, the government has even started weaning itself off of bank ownership, and the post office is free to lose as much money as it wants on behalf of its private investors now rather than taxpayers. I think the last major injection of government cash into the post office was probably when David Cameron decided to spend millions posting a Brexit leaflet to everyone in the country, and in the process convinced people who didn't like him to just vote leave in order to spite him. Evidently, if David Cameron thought that God was looking down on him, it was because he was plotting his revenge. Number 9, the F-35s. You know, the Harrier jump jet helped win the Falklands War back in 1982. That's the same year as the musical Cats opened on Broadway. And in many respects, both things were very popular, both lasted a very long time indeed. Nonetheless, the Sea Harriers were in many respects also like another 1982 thing, namely the album Thriller by Michael Jackson, universally applauded in the early 80s, but then viewed as slightly tarnished by the turn of the millennium. Just like Michael Jackson, the Harrier went through many cosmetic upgrades over the years before being eventually discontinued, albeit as part of a defence review rather than a drug overdose. And this, of course, led to the F-35 project, probably the most expensive project to come out of America that hasn't involved going to war, largely because decades on those F-35 fighters are still no closer to going to war than the very pretend and two-dimensional thing I'm drawing on a piece of paper right now. Nonetheless, the cost of the UK taxpayer is somewhat shy of £10 billion for 100 or so aircraft, all of which will face numerous farcical problems upon eventual delivery, like outdated software based on Windows XP, and electrical issues that apparently mean they have to stay 25 miles away from a thunderstorm, and sure you have to remember that the plane was being designed in an era when the only conceivable use for them was probably flying over a never-ending war and terror above Iraq, but the RAF do have a tendency to like to test these things in Scotland, where a lot of the stories begin with the line, quote, it was a dark and stormy night. Many of the design problems haven't been helped by the internal arguments between the Navy or the Air Force, or by a changing government set of priorities, both in terms of spending money and also whether or not to spend that money in Gordon Brown's old constituency where the aircraft carriers were being fitted for the sea version. It is worth noting again that the Harrier was a 40-year-old design and woefully underprepared for a modern war, but at the same time it's probably better prepared than an empty runway or a telephone with which to dial someone else and beg them for help if anything goes wrong in the meantime. It's worth noting as well that the US are still using theirs until the new plane arrives, although that's possibly like my doctor's surgery still having a fax machine because they're waiting on a new computer system to arrive. More on that later, I guess. Number 8, Gordon Brown's Gold Sale. And that sounds like a terrible game show idea for ITV3, but it couldn't be a list like this without including that one. You know, a lot of comedy is timing, and as such you have to give credit to Tony Blair, the greatest comedian of her age, who generously allowed Gordon Brown to begin his premiership just in time for the biggest financial collapse in a generation. You know, the political equivalent of a pie in the face, if John Prescott hadn't likely eaten all the pies first. Let's go with a different slapstick analogy, perhaps. Gordon Brown spent 20 years crafting an image of himself as a clever financial whiz who boasted about an end to boom and bust before presiding over the largest boom and bust since the 1920s, seeing the whole thing blow up in his face like Wally e. Coyote in one of the old Roadrunner cartoons. Over the previous decade, Brown had of course carefully sold off huge quantities of gold at bargain basement prices, and that stuff would have been handy then, only to see that gold suddenly become the most sought after expensive commodity in the world. And it makes you wonder if when he gets home he's got a cabinet full of beanie babies, or whether his wife trusts him to visit the garden centre in case he tries to remortgage the house and buy up all the Dutch tulips. There's certainly a schadenfreude about Brown having presided over it all, given that he was shadow chancellor during the ERM debacle 15 years prior and spent two decades carping on about how only he could be trusted not to mess things up. But unfortunately it wasn't just his reputation he bet on that trade, as taxpayers ultimately lost about £5 billion thanks to his negligence. Number 7, Foreign Aid. 
One of the legacies of the British Empire was the large network of countries abroad that retained ties both diplomatically and economically to the UK. Westminster is of course the mother of parliaments and countries like Australia, India and Kenya are Britain's children. At the same time though I'm a parent and there's nothing I've learned from being a parent that I couldn't easily as just have learned from setting fire to all my money. The UK currently spends about £15 billion on foreign aid every year, although that number is surprisingly difficult to pin down because so much of what is going on is classified as loans or export credit guarantees and the sort of financial dealings that made the government so keen to acquire the Royal Bank of Scotland back in the day and learn from its training manual. There are of course some very worthy things that some of that money goes to, but at the same time there's the long list of ludicrous examples too, such as continuing to write cheques to India, who are supposedly so poor that they have an active space programme. The list of spurious uses of the foreign aid budget could in itself be a separate top tens video, although it is important to note that the US spends about $50 billion on their equivalent budget, not including the line item simply marked as Ukraine, don't ask questions. Much of what is going on is of course an international game of quid pro quo, where payments to tin dictators have over the years resulted in business deals being made or mineral rights being acquired by British companies in return. David Cameron of course famously decided to frame the whole setup as an ethical one and made an equivalence of the government spending money in foreign aid to a normal person giving some money to a mainstream high street charity. The sort of charity of course where they're normally run by one of Dave's friends on a six figure salary. Yeah, I'm inclined to remember the expression that big charities are largely designed to transfer wealth from poor people in rich countries to rich people in poor countries. Number six, the EU. Let's stick with the foreign aid theme for a while with the European Union because Britain might be out but that was quite an expensive 47 years. The EU famously goes for the naming style of using the word union in its name in the same way that the Soviets did or how many other corrupt countries today use the term democratic in their name as a distraction. So anyway, here we go. There's an old expression that if you can count your money, you don't have a billion dollars. Well, true to form, the EU does have billions of dollars and has at the same time been repeatedly criticised for decades for being unable to produce accounts explaining where any of it's hidden or what it's being spent on. In many ways, that fact alone is the cornerstone of how every aspect of the European project is built. It's reliant on backhanders, greasing the wheels of politics, money going purposely missing in order to buy support against a public who see their money being frittered away in vanity projects. All while the political aims, lofty as they are, are mainly failures, whether it be preventing the war in Yugoslavia, providing a unified approach to COVID-19, fixing systemic financial problems in Southern Europe, or producing a Eurovision Song Contest winner that anyone actually remembers. And do note that the EU technically came in with the Maastricht Treaty, so don't give me ABBA, it doesn't count. There were of course many reasons for the 2016 Brexit vote, social, economic, but the vote would never have come close to happening without decades of press reported almost weekly examples of taxpayer money being squandered. Comic books presenting the EU as a federal country, museums of EU nationhood. A favourite of mine was when Jose Barroso once spent €28,000 on a four-night stay at New York's Peninsula Hotel. At the time of the Brexit vote, 214 Eurocrats were being paid more than David Cameron, the Prime Minister of an actual country. And it was actually a strategy at the time of Cameron's to force the EU to accept modernisation and reform and put its house in order and regain the public trust in order to keep Britain within the club. And none of that of course happened of course. In response the council failed to produce accounts, voted itself a bigger budget and told Britain that they'd have to pay regardless thanks to majority voting. Then they told David Cameron that it was his responsibility to accept it or risk being the PM that took Britain out of the project, which in retrospect is like threatening to give someone the keys to your car. Number 5. ID cards and their IT system. In 2005, the government wanted to institute a biometric passport system, and that would require people to get new ID cards, and it would also require the government to get a shiny new computer system. The government estimated the cost of the ID cards to be about £93 per person, and the cost of the equipment was going to be about £5 billion in total. But even Alan Sugar in his 1980s heyday couldn't get you that many computers for that kind of price. The true cost, of course, turned out to be about three times that at 300 quid a person, and about 12 to 18 billion pounds for the equipment, which presumably didn't even include the ongoing costs of the time that the civil service would have to spend on the customer service hotline at a pound 50 a minute. A couple of years later, having learned absolutely nothing, the government went on to upgrade its passport system in a £265 million contract with IBM, which could only really be justified on the basis that IBM sponsors Wimbledon, so maybe some of the money found its way down to grassroots tennis. A year or so ago, the Independent investigated Labour's 10 best well-known IT mistakes, and I'm surprised they could frankly narrow it down to 10, but they calculated a cumulative total of £26 billion pounds in wasted money. The biggest waste was a £12.7 billion plan for the NHS to start using a new electronic record-keeping system. Fewer than 200 out of the 9,000 healthcare organisations are actually using the technology, despite the fact that the money was spent on it faster than a drunk sailor on shore leave. Number 4. Iraq you know, looking back on things, it's remarkable to believe that Tony Blair was once very popular and trustworthy, so much so that he convinced the UK to back an illegal invasion of Iraq. You know, the strangest part was that he's just spent years concluding the Good Friday Agreement and brought peace to Northern Ireland, and he'd probably have a moderately respectable reputation these days if he hadn't tried to boost his poll ratings by feigning a mid-Atlantic accent and getting involved in a war. 
know, the financial cost of Iraq and Afghanistan is quite a complicated mess. Officially, it was £8 billion, which is a heck of a lot, although that is still a ludicrous undercosting and doesn't include, for instance, equipment that had long been depreciated off the MOD balance sheet. Some forms of accounting place a number at more like £20 billion, pounds. though again, that doesn't account for the long-term health care of wounded troops, which will linger with us for decades, or the cost of the resulting retaliatory attacks like 7-7, or the rise of ISIS, or that time when oil went to over $100 a barrel. And come to think of it, I heard a few people died in the process. I've actually got a friend who killed over 30 people in Iraq. I'm going to be honest, probably the worst mechanic the RAF ever hired. But joking aside, the long and short of it is that the whole region isn't just as bad as a place as it ever was. Tony Blair, it seems, having learnt not a lot from the whole tobacco, still defends his decision to invade the place with the lives of other people and other people's money. And he continues to mull around in that part of the world as a, quote, consultant. Although given his propensity to cash in on things, I imagine the only reason he signed up to get involved in the West Bank was because he thought he'd be on the board of the directors at an actual bank. Number three, public-private partnerships. You know, there's an old joke about someone asking their careers advisor about pursuing a career in organised crime, and the teacher responds by asking whether they mean the government or the private sector. So anyway, public-private partnerships, or PPP, they were an idea thought up where consultancy companies would pay for lots of shiny schools and hospitals, then slowly sell them back to the government, slowly being the keyword here. But it would mean that Gordon Byrne could officially be seen to be borrowing less money and debts wouldn't be shown on the balance sheet, and the likes of Capita could afford to give everybody a pay rise. I'm joking, of course, it was just the senior management that got the pay rises. As an example, though, the shiny new St Bartholomew's Hospital in central London costs £1.4 billion to build, but it will eventually cost the UK taxpayers £9.1 billion by the end of the contract. Or in the case of the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, the government will never own it because it's on a perpetual lease system in which the government can only get out of the contract by just walking away and closing the hospital, which doesn't look very good for a politician to do. You know, probably the only way the Chancellor could get out of it would be to just let the SNP get their way and have the thing if they want it so badly, not unlike a divorcing couple arguing about which of them's on the hook for the timeshare they signed up to years prior, before coronavirus meant it was not only expensive but also illegal to visit the darn place. Number two, nuclear programmes. Here's one for you. If you don't know the price of a nuclear power plant, wait until you see the Chernobyl. Get it? Anyway, I can make a point as to whether I'm talking about civil or military, but the thing is that all the UK nuclear programs are part of the same machine. At least the French are honest enough to admit that they subsidise the nuclear electricity industry so they can have nuclear armed and powered submarines. How does the UK play out? Well, back in 2006, the government managed to sell the idea of the Trident nuclear missile system by citing a cost of less than £25 billion. Still quite a lot of money, to be honest. However, in an accounting manoeuvre presumably stolen from the desk of Robert Maxwell, this cost didn't take into consideration the long-term cost of maintaining the equipment once it was brought into place. The real cost for this programme ended up at more than three times the initial projections, and again this is still before the contracts for the prerequisite power stations are agreed, roughly £20 billion apiece. The real problem here is that the government forged ahead with a plan without actually allowing a debate to take place. More recently, a sensible debate was impossible, in part because of Brexit and the involvement with the French, but largely because the opposition party was led by Jeremy Corbyn, a man who on paper was passionately opposed to nuclear weapons, yet at the same time couldn't decide whether he thought Russia or Iran having them was okay or not. Before he was forced to step down, I always wondered if he'd discovered that the sun is in fact a large thermonuclear reaction, and therefore make it Labour Party policy to, quote, open a dialogue with the sun and ask it to please stop shining. A policy that would no doubt go down well with Owen Jones, who thinks that his sun shines out of his rear end. Number 1. HS2. The go-ahead for the high-speed 2 railway line to the West Midlands, or possibly Scotland, comes in as the biggest public project in peacetime, at a cost of anywhere from £32 billion to perhaps £100 billion, depending on the price of land and who you ask and what route they eventually go for. It's egregious enough that it actually attracts an interesting set of activists from across the political spectrum, being forced to act together. On one hand, you've got the traditionalists who object to the profligate waste and the destruction and the colossal cost of it all, and they're being forced to hold hands with the green activists who like trains but also dislike the concept of long-distance travel in general, and they hate builders in the countryside although they do take delight in it largely carving its way through the sort of places that voted for Boris and Brexit. HS2 is at this point the definition of a sunk cost fallacy. Nobody wants to be the person who admits that the thing was a whole waste of time and money that could have been spent on better things. And there's probably a joke in there about the government wanting to cover their tracks or what their locomotives are at this stage. Either way, it's a ludicrous vanity project that will ultimately save commuters about 20 minutes on a trip between Birmingham and London and all being planned at a time when businesses are now forging plans for people to mostly work from home in the future. Forget the idea of upgrading existing railway lines or building a genuinely new link like the oft-talked about Stranraer to Northern Ireland Sea Tunnel, which would actually cost about £6 billion, which is about 20% of the minimum cost of this whole thing. And in reality, forget about that high-speed line going as far as Glasgow or Edinburgh. It really is saying something that the part of the railway that would link Scotland to London and bring potential financial benefits to Scotland, paid for by London, was ruled out because even the SNP failed to back the dubious financials underwriting the whole thing. And that's like offering to buy Oliver Reed a drink and him turning it down because he'd had enough. I guess to sum it up, part of life is living with a government that behaves like Oliver Reed, occasionally professional, often respected on the world stage, but also incredibly keen to liquidise your assets.
when it comes to spending money on myself though well i always remember some advice was given which is that it's always worth spending on good speakers that was some sound advice anyway i hope you enjoyed this week's longer format see you next week if i have these clicks subscribe